Hey, it's Carl with Slick Rooster Studio. <laughs> I forgot where I was for a second. Um, <laughs> okay, off to a fantastic start. So, in the in my Amazon deliveries today, this showed up at the door. Um, I ordered this like a day ago, or maybe two days. Uh, this showed up in in one of my Amazon, uh, like after you buy something, it says, Hey, you might also be interested in this. Amazon, you devils. Um, and it turns out I was. Uh, this costs $12.99. Um, this is a Doodle Hog watercolor paint metal tin set. And this is the 36 color one. Uh, it was on sale for $12.99, which is the same price as the 24 color one, which is the, the, the standard metal tin um, that's only you know half this size. $12.99. For this type of tin alone is is worth it. So I don't care what the paints are. Uh, it was worth the twelve ninety nine. I'll I'll revamp the the tin and it came to my door with the cello wrap. You know, like a standard manufacturing just factory sealed wrap, and they had stuck the Amazon shipping label just right to that. This was just laying in my driveway with other you know packaged Amazon things that you know have the uh the bubble wrap packages and this was just sitting there on top of them and i was like oh man this is not going to be good um but this is a sturdy box uh i was i unwrapped it and i was really i'm out i was really surprised at how i mean this is a substantial box uh I'm clearly not going to keep these watercolors. Uh, you know, I got this for the tin. Um, so when I sell sell it off, I'll sell all of this stuff off for somebody that bought this set or a set like it and wants to refill their colors. Uh, this is just kind of impressive, actually. I mean, for for that price, uh, it's got a. It's got this, well, this is pre-printed, so these are probably not remotely close to what they actually are. Wow, look at these names. What in the world? Okay, so these names are silly. Uh, there's no there's no correlation to any pigment names, like, like Ultramarine Blue. That could be the Harbor Blue, could be the Egyptian Blue. Um, could be the Sapphire or the Midnight Navy. What is, those boats only go at night. Sneaky, the sneaky navy. Um, so yeah, that's everything in there. So apparently, apparently, it comes with a with a water or a water brush, which I didn't pay attention to that when I ordered it. Um, I was looking at the I was looking at the logo when it first got here. I don't remember if I got my autofocus turned on. I probably don't. Um, if I have the autofocus turned on on this web camera that I'm using up there. Uh, every time I move my hand a into a different plane of existence than where I'm trying to film, the focus just goes in and out. It's just it's horrible to watch. So I set the focus down flat on here where I'm working when I'm painting. So, uh, huh. all right. So enough of that. Had a cup of coffee. It's actually fairly late. Um, I mean, kind of a miserable week in Texas. The the pollens and the and the, the allergens are just thick in the air. Uh, today we had a the air quality alert in the Fort Worth area. Um, just yeah, not not great outside, and yeah, it's just been. I got a pinched nerve in my back for the last two and a half months, so sleeping right now is just not not working. So yeah, a cup of coffee and uh, let's make some uh, Friday night videos through the through the the night. Um, yep, tangents. That's what I do. So anyways, I was looking at this logo. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Um, I don't know if there's a, yeah, that's a little bigger. Uh, is that going to focus? Did I have it? I don't know why I keep trying. I, it's just, all right, let's go to this one. God, I can't see it when I put it in front of my face. <laughs> all right, you see that, that guy, um, I looked at it, looked at it, I'm, I'm thinking doodle hog, I'm thinking, you know, in Texas we have hogs here, uh, it's, you know, pigs. 
And I'm like, what is that? And it dawned on me, oh, somebody got clever. Uh, oh, Chinese companies. That is a hedgehog made out of pencils. Um, it's got five pencils poking up, and that's the pokey part of the hedgehog, the stylistic pokey part of the hedgehog, and the little upturned, cute, pointy nose, which, you know, hedgehogs are super cute. So the doodle hog is a hedgehog. I can get behind that. That's that's pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't immediately apparent. Like, is that a bear paw? What, what am I looking at? So I like the font. Yeah, it's kind of a cool... They did well with their marketing. Uh, it's a great box. Um, all this stuff is cool. You know, clearly watercolor stuff. The the color names are good. Yeah, color names are dumb. Um, so this is this is actually a great set for a beginner. Um, for somebody who's not, you know, just starting out. Uh, now, granted, I haven't even I haven't looked at the paints. Uh, they could be complete trash. But this is, I mean, this is good advice on here, and it's well worded. It's not, you know, weird broken pigeon English that you'll you'll see sometimes. I've I've saved some of the stuff that I've gotten with my uh, my Chinese brush sets, and it's it's hard to figure out what they're trying to tell you. With with they use big words and they're mashed together grammatically in a way that's just what. And yeah, so I cut them out, put them in my scrapbook because it's uh, they're amazing. But this is, I mean, about cleaning the water brush, uh, taking care of the paints, a little bit of uh, instruction on on what stuff is, you know, simple simple techniques, some texturing. It's pretty cool. Um, thank you for choosing premium watercolor paints by Doodle Hog. We hope they're the perfect portable solution for you and your art because we care about your happiness. In fact, we guarantee it. If something's not right with the product, you can email it. it this is a $12.99 metal tin. Uh, full-size metal tin. I have paid well more than that for other full-size tins. Oh, that's cool. Primaries, secondaries, tertiaries. That's really cool. But they're, they're, this is a helpful little thing. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you know, first first go at watercolors, this, this is a good start. Uh, again, the, the names are absolutely useless. Uh, I would actually, I would encourage anyone who's starting out with watercolor to just take a Sharpie marker and wipe all that out. Don't even pay attention to them because I mean, saffron orange, this is, this is aimed at a crafter person. Uh, it's not, yeah, the, the, the names are, are going to be, if you really want to learn watercolors, ignore these names, aside from turquoise. I mean, there's, they make sense. I mean, grass, lime green, misty, aqua. Ugh, come on. Bright purple indigo. Not useful. Um, coffee bean. All right, now we're getting... Uh, there's a couple of them. Golden honey and warm field look like the same color. And butterscotch isn't far off. Oh, all right. With 36 brilliant hues and one water brush print, pen... Premium watercolor paints by Doodle Hog offer the perfect combination of quality and convenience in one compact carrying case. Well, okay. Designed with beginner to intermediate artists in mind. Okay, so they're not saying this is a pro set. This set of half pan, non toxic watercolors lets you take your art anywhere. All right, standard stuff. Quick drying paints featuring beautiful, highly pigmented, <laughs> highly pigmented. Um, man, that gets used a lot. Uh, misused a lot like criminally misused i guarantee i haven't used these paints yet but i guarantee you here this is one of my m gram sets i will splash this out on a piece of paper after touching it with a with a drop of water and it will show you what highly pigmented really means this is these are not going to be highly pigmented 12.99 but still i don't like marketing fluff i don't like i mean at that point you're just lying a, a highly pigmented, I guess, in could be could be taken in in. Uh, I guess in perspective, in relation to your own products, like maybe your other products are crappy. I don't know. Uh, and this is like the best one. It's like the sharpest marble in the bag. Uh, silly. Uh, so yeah, I that kind of stuff. Uh, you see, a lot of these companies. Ton. I don't think I've ever seen a cheap 
Junko watercolor company go, yeah, these are just mediocre quality. They're, they all say it's artist grade, and they are not artist grade. Uh, if you actually are trying to be, these aren't even student grade. These are scholastic grade at best. Um, like Prang or, or Crayola. They're, they're, they're something, uh, if, if you're a student of a discipline, you're taking steps to learn how to become better at it. It's and this is not helpful. These ridiculous names. There's no pigment information at all. Uh, this is not a student set of watercolors. I guarantee it. Um, now, okay. In relation to other student sets of watercolors, Van Gogh, Cotman, uh, just you know the list. Uh, they list their pigments. They use good pigments. They might be a little bit diluted, uh, diluted, not diluted. <laughs> um, I'm sure they're all very lucid and, and aware of, you know, reality. Uh, yeah, so anyways, student student watercolor paints, uh, especially Van Gogh, it's probably my favorite still because it is a one-to-one -one relationship between Van Gogh and then the Talons, or like the Rembrandt, their, their, their pro quality or artist grade uh, paints. They, they use the same pigments from one to the next, except for, I don't believe the cadmiums anymore. Are, are actual cadmiums in the student grade. They're going to use hues and things like that, but that's okay. Um, Van Gogh watercolors behave like professional watercolors, as do Cotman. Cotman's are, they're a little, um, they're weakly pigmented in comparison. Uh, you can still get a lot of, you can get good color out of them, but it takes some layering. Uh, when they're when they're wet, they've got a kind of a gooey consistency to them. All right, this is not enough about Cotman. Um, Van Gogh I like better than Cotman. I like Van Gogh because they behave just like most professional watercolors. Um, I doubt these are going to do that. Uh, these are going to be more like uh, oh, the Jerry Q watercolor sets and, you know, the, the cheap Chinese watercolor sets. Um, and nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can play and goof around with these and, and have fun and, you know, give them to your kids. Uh, and they'll feel like, you know, they've got this professional tin, and this is absolutely a professional tin. This is an artist grade tin. Matter of fact, this that's really substantial. I have a couple of I have a couple other ones that aren't as good. Well, let's all right, let's get rid of this box. We've talked about the yeah, this is they got a guarantee on there and they're probably I, I I'm not gonna bother contacting them, but I'm sure their customer service is going to be happy to help. I haven't heard anything one way or the other. But all right. So cram that in there. All right, let's have a look. Um one thing to note these the enamel on this is really good. This thing is in surprisingly good shape for coming here just with that just with that box on it. I mean, there's no it's not been stepped on or crushed. Now, this could be a uh result of of the shipping the people maybe we got good amazon d delivery guys or something um got the oh, oh that's a sticker the little doodle hog so like like schmincke and lucas they are actually their their insignia or logo is in the paint where this is just a, a sticker over the top i'm gonna leave it on there though I, I like the i like the pencil hedgehog guy um ooh, wow oh and it comes with a Huh, that's actually, well, it's watercolor paper. I don't know. If it's, I doubt it's cotton, um, but it's better than a lot of the a lot of the swatch sheets that you get. Uh, I'm not going to use this. I'm good because I'm going to get rid of these paints. I, I'm, there's no reason for me to keep these paints. I'm going to sell them on eBay or whatever as a refill set for somebody else who has this. Has this kit? Wow, is that lavender? What is? Okay, this is perfectly white. This is like a great, uh, especially this part. It's like a real bright lavender. The the what's supposed to be the white enamel. Uh, how about the mixing? Maybe it's a gray, a grayish lavender on purpose to help you see, you know, like a neutral color. Although well, it's not neutral, it's definitely got a purple tinge to it, violet. Um, to help you see what you're you're mixing. I don't know, like like when I'm working with gouache and stuff, I, I've got a, somewhere here, I've got a gray, gray colored, like a super neutral gray colored plate that I got at Goodwill for like 50 cents or whatever. 
Um, it works great for mixing gouache because with gouache, you know, it's opaque and you use a lot of white. So on a white plate, if you're using white, it's uh, you kind of lose track of where it's at. But the gray is really nice because I can see I can see color mixing. So maybe that's why they're using this color on the inside. Got a little bend. In, ooh, okay. The little the little finger grippy doodaddy to, to make that they they cut it's rolled which is great but they cut through the rolled edge to make that and i mean i i to open it up i just stuck a fingernail under the edge and they made that pretty weak uh, you see i just bent it yeah i would left that hole oh it's sharp too um yeah i would left that left that hole just for the strength um but you know the hinges. These are the standard hinges that you get with Schmincke, Lucas. Like if all of these companies that use these tins use the same um, design, yeah. It's, I mean, it's as good a quality as anything else. Um, the paints, yeah, they look chalky and well, they're not. I, wow, they are hard. Like with. Uh, who the koi you can you can scratch it and it's like a whack crayon it'll come off on your fingernail these are man those are brittle uh i'll be curious to see how well they the color pulls off of them actually i'm not going to use very many of them i'm just gonna i'm gonna grab five or six of them and make a quick little landscape and the rest of it just gets sold off because there's so much and so many colors here that are clearly full of filler but all right we're gonna take this out um yeah, this, I don't even need this. This will get, I'll just put this, actually I'll wrap it carefully um, to make sure all the the pans stay in place and stuff it in here. I'll sell the whole thing on eBay for five, ten bucks or something. Um, and I'll reuse this. I'll put a piece of styrene in the bottom of this and then fill it with whole pans. Um, I might make a, actually I might make a a butcher tray style palette out of this this is the, i i don't have one of these metal tins with just you know a piece of flat styrene i don't need these mixing wells in here there's plenty out here um so yeah if i put a flat piece of, of sheet styrene with a nice a white styrene in there and then um uh can cut it perfectly so it rests on the edges it's thick enough that it's not going to buckle down in these these well indentations and then i'll just put blobs of paint around the outside and mix it into the middle maybe maybe some paint in the middle too uh, yeah uh this is this is as good a quality on oh, the edges are rolled here too yeah and there's that's a little sharp around there where they cut it but again this is as as cheap as any of these that i ever bought um, in fact yeah, there we go This is my one of my whiskey painter ones, and I paid more for this empty tin than I did for this whole set of watercolors. And it's a, to me, it's this is a better tin, the one the the, the doodle bug with it, doodle hog. Um, it's doodle bug. That's a better name. Um, the whiskey painter one is the metal feels cheaper. Um, wow, it's actually smaller. Hmm. It's it's got the the top is flattened on it. Um, same hinges, same exact. I'm sure that this I could probably bend this one too. Yeah, it, it, it's the same rolled edge. Um, I put double sided tape on the end, so you can see the sheet styrene that I put. I put it in this tray, and then I put double sided tape under the tray and stuck the whole thing down just so I can you know. It doesn't fall out when I do that. Not that I do that a lot, but um, so this, and then I just filled it with, oh, I got seven, 35, 35 full pans, and this is all artist grade watercolor. Um, and then I proceeded to not use it after I, I had more fun building this thing and I probably will use it. This is a lot of colors for, for one tin, um, but they're all fantastic art colors. There's probably $100 worth of paint in there. Um, Yeah, and then I never used it again. But this tin is not as 
substantial feeling is this one. This is more like my the like the like the Lucas and Schminka ones that you get. Um, I got one here somewhere. Here we go. Matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet that's the exact same tin. Paints a little better on this one, but well, it's shinier. <clears throat> This one's got a couple scratches in it, but that's just from me. I mean, they're going to get beat up and banged up as I use them. Um, oh, see, now the Lucas one is not rolled around the edge here. It's a little sharp. Um, and it's not going to be as strong. Like, I could dent that and move it and whatnot. Yeah. Same idea with this one. Uh, I just, I took all the stuff. Oh, no. Did I buy? I, I bought this empty from Jerry's. Um. And I just filled it with, uh, what do I got, 28 uh, artist grade paints in here. I'll have to, I got to go through and make a chart of this. I know what they all are, but uh, uh, again, didn't use it very much after I built it. It's it's kind of, when I'm working small, I mean, you see, this takes up half of my, my usable workspace when I'm doing ACEOs. So. And I really don't like these trays all that much. Yeah, see, that's got the same indentations underneath of it. It's just not rolled. But again, I, I think I paid 20 bucks for this empty. And these are only useful if you're going to swap your your pans around, really. And then you got all this wasted space between them. It's like, yeah, I know you could try to cram a brush or something down in there. But in order to change these, the little, you know, the little metal rails that, that hold the, the pans in, you gotta. Oh, well, that's not even riveted. No. Yeah, they're they're like machine punched to stick into place. So you'd have to pry them off of there to reuse it. I, it's just I'd rather put a sheet of styrene in there and and get rid of the tray because it's. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of weight to this metal tray. You know, if you're really looking to to be portable and lightweight. So, anyways, enough about the Lucas one. Um, yeah, this is a this is a great tin. It's it's better than the whiskey painter one. It feel it feels better. The whiskey painter one feels flimsy compared to this. Uh, I, I just I wish they hadn't cut that. I suppose I could I could run a little pin between between. Eh, it's not that big a deal. Um, and the gray color is a little weird. The gray uh, it's, it's lavender. It looks this especially looks lavender. And it, it, my my camera's not picking it up, but it's it is. There's a red tint to that that's crazy when i'm looking at it um yeah it picks it up a little bit but it's a little more subdued in here but it's still definitely not white like my sheet styrene is is that color that's that's this is a piece of strathmore um 500 illustration board or whatever it is um cotton illustration board all right so enough of that i will i'm going to set this off to the side and just not worry about it I don't need to mix for what I'm planning to do. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna send this along when I sell this little guy off, and somebody can have fun making their own swatch card and and enjoy themselves. And this will be, you know, they can. Uh, oh, sweet! I was gonna pry one of these out of here to see if it came out, but yep, it comes right out. Oh, wow, that's hot glue. Let's see Oh yeah, it's sticky. I don't think it's it's not sticky, but it's not hard like an Elmer's glue. And the pigment, boy, I think that's hot glue. I think they hot glued the cakes into the into the pan. Nah, whatever. Uh, yeah, not gonna use the the water brush either. Yeah, I'll send that along. Basically, sell off everything but the but the tin, and then I'll I'll uh. Customize that the way I want it. So we're gonna pick. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't think I want to reorganize these because. Yeah, they're at least my best guess. Flagstone, yeah, black leather. What is black leather? Why don't I just call it black? And there's no identifiers on here. All right, so I'm not going to 
I'm not going to monkey around with moving these things around. Because whoever gets this, this is the only way that they're going to know what's what's in there. Yeah, soft apricot, Egyptian blue, soft royal. What is that? Um, hibiscus. What? This, whatever. It's not the only color of hibiscus. Uh, do I even want to... I mean, there's other there's other people out there that have done reviews of these colors. I tell you what, I, just for my own curiosity, I'm gonna I'm gonna swatch a couple of them. Uh, uh, 100% cotton watercolor paper always. No reason to cripple yourself right out of the box. What colors? All right, that's that's yellow. All right, what are they calling that? That to me looks just like yellow ochre. Golden honey. Oh, that one's called nettle. I guess it's like a nettle plant, so that's going to be probably a looks like a foresty green. Green olive, butterscotch, what is that? Coffee bean, lucky penny. Well, all right. We're going to leave this out so I can reference what I'm, which ones I'm using. So we will re-wet and vibrant yellow versus goldenrod. Let's, let's, let's do the goldenrod. I'm trying not to splash too much water down into the, into the, pan between the cake and the pan just because whoever gets it might want to might want to pull those cakes and every little bit of paint that runs down the side is going to help glue that thing in the into the pan so this is their golden rod that's bright that looks like it could be a py97 or a py154 something like that it's got some sediment in it. It's, it's definitely not not fully transparent. Um, all right, so that would be a yellow if I wanted to keep going. What are these colors? I'm curious about the deep coral. What does that look like? They re-wet pretty well. They... Uh, they re-wet about like um, koi, the koi sets do. And so this was deep coral. That looks like a pearl, a pearl red. PR254, something like that. Um, decent red. It could be a nap fall or something too, like PR, PR112 or something like that. All right, what else might I use? I, and I probably wouldn't use a lot of red. I was just curious to see what they call deep coral. Um, pinks and purple, I don't need that. What is likely to be their ultramarine? Harbor blue. Huh. None of them look like... Let's try Egyptian blue. Wow, that got milky quick, and you, I don't know if you can see it. That looks like there's some filler or some white, a mixing white or something in there. Wow. I don't know if I'll be able to tell what color that is or not. That looks like it's probably ultramarine with some white mixed in with it. Super, super opaque. For as weak as it is, it's really opaque. Um, I mean, that would wash out to a nice sky color. You know. Subdued sky. It's not unusable. Hmm. 
All right, so that and that's their Egyptian blue. We're gonna leave that alone. See how it granulates. I imagine. I I, I imagine it's going to granulate because that does look like a, a PB twenty nine like ultramarine blue based color. Yeah, decent sky color. Let's see how it lifts or pulls. And it's got some blue on it. That nah, doesn't matter. Just rolling a little piece of paper towel across the sky to make some poofy clouds and see how it pulls the pulls the paint. Oh, okay, so that's not a real staining color. Well, it's really weak too, so that yeah, makes decent clouds. Yeah, it's real weak. Uh, Real weak, but it's a decent uh, ultramarine. Yeah, that milkiness is so disconcerting. It's just, why would you... I mean, ultramarine is so cheap to begin with. I, I don't get... I mean, because it comes with a white. Little bit of granulation. I want to see how these, how their, their surfactant levels are. Surfactant is like, you know, ox gall or, or something like that. When you mix it with a paint, when you charge your brush, here, I'll just, I'll do it with this coral color. You get paint in your brush and then you dab it into a, into a watercolor or just a water puddle, how fast it disperses. Um, pretty flat. It does a little bit, but this reminds me. This reminds me more of like uh, Japanese, what Holbein, yeah, even yeah, no, not Shinhan. Uh, like Eastern watercolors are very static. They when when they when they hit the the water, they kind of just funk right there, right where they are. Um, ox go. I have some ox go. Well, this is Lucas. I think this is fake ox gall. They call it their wedding agent. Um, same idea. Essentially, it's soap. Uh, I don't know. When, you know, when you were a kid, I'm just trying to get a tiny little bit of this stuff. And then I'm going to wash right out because I need a puddle of water to, to kind of show you what it does. M. Graham uses a ton of this stuff in all of their paints, it feels like. Um, it's just, it's, it's essentially soap and it's what causes that, that, um, oh, the colors just explode into a wash and, and people misunderstand why that happens. It has nothing to do with the quality of the paint. It has nothing to do with, with how finely ground the pigments are or what the pigment load is. See, that's with, that's with some ox gall, just a tiny little bit. See how it just shoves and pushes when we were kids. Um, I remember in school, uh, one of the experiments that we did in, in science class, like a third, fourth grade or something, was uh, we would sprinkle pepper onto a bowl of water, and the pepper would just sort of sit there, and then you would drop like a, like a drop of dish soap onto the, just like in the middle of the bowl of water, and it would hit the surface and go boom, and blow all the pepper off to the side. Same stuff. Same, it's just soap. Um, the more you put of this stuff, and you can you can mix this stuff into your pans while you're pouring them, and all of a sudden all of your colors will explode into washes too. And look how juicy they are, and all these things that I see people say about M. Graham. <clears throat> the problem is, the more of that stuff you use, the more it cuts through the sizing of the paper, and that's what makes it stain. Um, it it if you use enough of that in 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 watercolor, I don't care what kind of sizing or what paper you have, you can get the best watercolor paper ever. Um, you make a, a watercolor paint with a heavy, heavy, uh, surfactant like that in it. And you put the brush on the paper and it will blow into the paper, just like absorb right in. It won't, there will be no wash or drift or anything. It's, 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 uh, and that's where you get, that's why it stains, um, has nothing to do with pigment load or, or how finely ground they are. Uh, 
it's it just changes the chemical aspect of the of the paint and makes it cut through the sizing which is also another chemical that's sitting on top it's just a brushed on uh, i don't know if it's brushed on or sprayed on whatever it's a top coating uh that protects the protects the paper from absorbing the paint too fast well this surfactant soap cuts through that sizing that that protectant and goes right into the fiber of the paper um no yeah all right little uh, little watercolor paint formulation education there for you uh you see that it it, it dispersed pretty well as it sat there um or is this one exploded and then it sort of sunk in like it's not moving anymore like see these long tendrils here that it just kept reaching out so by adding that soap to it i, I sucked it into the, the sizing a little bit so initially it, it blew out but then it kind of sunk in um all right so back to these guys let's have a look at the yellow ochre let's see if butterscotch that is a nasty looking butterscotch we'll try the butterscotch oh see there there it goes milky again and it's really brightening up this this does remind me of koi watercolors a lot and probably a million other cheap chinese sets of paint oh that's a nice color a burnt sienna sort of a color up kind of on the pr 101 side of burnt sienna i think and very opaque probably a lot of filler a lot of something in there which gives you that milky film on the top when you first wet them down all right so how's the the golden honey i mean i'm guessing that this is yellow ochre like a py 42 or 43 we'll see yep pretty standard pretty standard yellow ochre so i mean you could go through here and probably pick out 12 paints that at least as a landscape artist um 12 paints that are that are good enough for painting you know something that you would want to keep forever i would definitely do a light fastness test on these i'm not sure how much uh, uh how much these weird fillers are going to do to to change the light fastness of the the pigments that are there um ocean teal i'm curious about the ocean teal that is looking very much like a phthalo turquoise or a mix between phthalo blue and phthalo green all right it looks exactly like what that is so yeah decent color still it's not it, it, it's got some filler although these ones over here when i first put them on they definitely had some it looked opaque but it dried out and the the black lines have come through so i don't know what that means exactly all right so there's that what's the all right so if that's ocean teal what does turquoise look like more green at least as as far as the milky film looks like like, like on the top there yep just a little more green no mystery there probably also a phthalo green olive looks like a convenience mix i don't know if the camera's picking it up how how much these lighten on the cake when you when you start wetting them that's not a normal thing oh that's pretty nice it's a nice color it's got some yellow undertone to it mm. I wasn't planning on checking all these colors, but it's kind of fun. All right, so nettle is a is a good olive. Um, yeah, that's a nice color. I mean, for landscape. <clears throat> okay, so between golden golden honey. And butterscotch, we got warm field. I got to try that. Looks like it's got some 
I don't know, it's changing color as I wet it. Wow, you know, that looks like that looks like Nicolazo yellow. I would be willing to bet money that's Nicolazo yellow. I might have to rethink about whether or not I'm going to sell these. Some of these colors are pretty nice. Hmm. Yeah, that looks that's super transparent and got some orange to it. I bet that dries out to a, kind of a green. Warm field, huh? Yeah, but the fact that I'm going to, you know, sell, I would sell these and get 5 or $10 for them. So, you know, if, if I, I can come out of here with, with six pans of an actual watercolor color, um, that'd be worth keeping. And, you know, actually just write the names of them on it. Both of these greens look like convenience mixes. That looks like PB16. I think it's PB16, the, the turquoise, the phthalo turquoise. That looks like a mix. I don't know why you would add anything to PY42 to make it look like that. That looks like PY42. This is probably PR101. That's definitely PB29. That is that is a granulating, really weak um, ultramarine blue. Yeah, I may end up keeping these and doing a, a full light fastness test on them. What is this one? This one's called Coffee Bean. That looks a lot like a burnt umber. That could be a burnt umber or it could be a, a PR101 and black mix too. It's definitely red. It's got It's got some red to it. So what is Lucky Penny? I mean, that to me would say copper. What, how is, what? It's a little more yellow than whatever that was, coffee bean. Flagstone is a gray, uh, and it looks like a fairly useless one. This is like a Davies gray or something. There's there's a white. It's just probably black and white mixed. Yeah, that's a chalky, opaque, black and white mixed gray. Black leather. Let's have a look at that. I'm curious to see what makes this different than just regular old run-of-the-mill black. It's just a clever name. Yeah, that's just black. That looks like PBK6 or just a standard, standard non-granulating dull black I was thinking that it might it does have a bit of a warm tone to it maybe that's where they're getting the leather hmm. so there's a bunch of colors I wouldn't ever use uh, let's have a look at Misty Aqua I just that looks like it's trying to be cobalt teal, but there again, the milky, the milky paint. I, I, seems like there's going to be some white in there. So cobalt teal is something I use a lot in skies. Oh, that's not bad. I doubt it's a cobalt, um, and it's awfully green. And you know, mixing it with white would would knock that green down. Like I sometimes I keep a a Chinese white or PW four in my palettes for a mixing white because because titanium white P, PW six is is very strong, um, very opaque. Whereas the the zinc white is a is a great mixing white to add some body to the some body to the paint. I don't know, man. Um, these behave pretty well. Uh, would I call them professional? Absolutely not. Uh, <clears throat> just because of the fact that they don't disclose their pigments. Um, such a simple, you would think a simple thing to do, and by not doing it, it makes them seem a little shady. That's a bright, that's, that's, I would be willing to bet there's something else beside PY42 in there. That's a lot of yellow. 
And what do we have? How would we? That's a little too orange to mix with this yellow to get a to get like a raw sienna. Yeah, that's just orange. Uh, Lucky Penny is too orange. Maybe the what is it? Coffee bean. Let's try to get a little coffee bean in there. Yeah, that's a little bit of a a raw sienna. Another pet peeve of mine: not having raw sienna in a in a set like this. I mean, that's that's one of the cheapest pigments ever. It's you know PBR seven, just earth dirt color. And raw sienna is one of the most versatile, at least an earth base, like a PBR seven base raw sienna, uh, super versatile landscape color, and even for uh, portraiture flesh tones and things it's it's a nice it's a nice uh color for for skin shades and 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 shading yeah i don't think i'm going to sell this set of paints i think what i'll do is do a more in-depth review. Uh, this video is getting kind of long, um, but it's not super in-depth as far as studying the paints and, and, and learning paints. Yeah, it cost me nothing to set this back on a shelf and later on down the road dive into a little more, but I'm pretty impressed for $12.99. Even though there's a bunch of goofy colors in here that I, don't, I wouldn't normally use. There's so many purples and pinks and and uh, a lot of purples. Uh, who needs that much further? Well, I guess people who are painting greeting cards and festive things, they like those colors, but I don't. I mean, give me a good red, a good blue, and a good yellow, and you can make most all of these other colors. That candy pink looks eerily like opera pink, which, you know, people get they geek out so much over over opera pink and like oh my god it's so beautiful and bright and 20 minutes later it's so fugitive because it's you know it's just a dye um it just turns gray and disappears i'm just taking the best look i can at turning this into a ace picture I do a lot of, uh, I'm going to change brushes. This squirrel brush just holds way too much water. Go back to my trusty, cheap Chinese random rodent hair brush. Weasel or ermine or whatever they're, whatever they use. Some kind of fake Kalinsky. All right, so bright indigo purple. No, terrible. Ugh. Yeah, none of these purples are great. What's Midnight Navy? That's got to be... I, I can't imagine. No, that might be Prussian, actually. That might be Prussian blue. Yeah, that looks extremely Prussian. Um... God, it's, I mean, it's stupid of me to, to keep these paints. I have so many paints. I have great, great palettes. So that's either a, a, a dark phthalo or it is Prussian. So what's that leave this guy? What is this? This is Harbor Blue. Well, crap, maybe that's the Prussian. I don't know. That's a little darker and dingier. Yeah, I don't know. I'm running out of... Trying to find a good color for... 
Eh, that'll work. It's a subdued color to add some hills in the background here, my little landscape. That'll work. Add a little of this, what the hell was it? Egyptian blue. Some of that charge. Wow. I picked up nothing there. It's such a weak color. All right, we're gonna uh, we'll grab some coffee bean, clean off some of that yellow ochre that I put on there. Awfully green for a background color. We're going to blue that up, add some neutral to it. I'm just using the black as a just kind of a quick and dirty deal. I'm sorry, the black leather. That sounds way cooler. Just adding some doodads and bushes along this little road that I put up here. And in the foreground, we're going to take more of this net. I like that nettle color. It's pretty nice. It's a good olive green. I'm going to dry brush some of that across the foreground. I'm doing there. I just I'm using the paper as my kind of my mixing area. I don't use a lot of my I don't use my palettes a lot for mixing, unless I'm doing you know big washes or something like that. For for this small stuff, I like to just dab it onto the paper, and I can I can mix between piles, and it's easy to pick up you know light amounts of of paint instead of especially with like the M gram. It's so hard to grab just a tiny amount. I always end up overdoing it on the on the colors when I'm going for something subdued I end up with this huge dark mess all right we're gonna use we're gonna get some shadow color it's obviously I can't use the that ultramarine as a shadow it's just too weak um so we're gonna dive into what was it the the harbor blue was a little I don't wonder what pigment that is or if it's a mix we're gonna take the harbor blue and we're gonna mix it in with the we're gonna put a little god I, these names mix a little burnt umber with it not coffee bean burnt umber all right i need more mystery blue here that gives me a good shadow uh we'll say the light's coming from well clearly i made a choice on my mountains back there the light's coming from this way because my mountains already have the shadows. Once we got this nice dark shadow puddle, puddle over here we're gonna we're gonna put some heavy shadows from trees or something that are off on this side over here somewhere just to kind of break up the monotony of this foreground then we're gonna Need more coffee bean, please.
Oops. No way. Not a mistake. Meant to do that. We got a little tree in the foreground, and that needs some more shadow. All right, so the color, let's see, we're gonna we're gonna nettle this foliage up here. At least we're gonna start with nettle. Oh, I picked up something else in there too. I got my brush. I got an orange in there. Come on, nettle. And we'll get some vibrant yellow. We haven't tried that one yet. It looks a bit like a PY3. And this, the goldenrod could be a PY1 too, which is not a very good color. I mean, it's a beautiful color, it's just not a very light fast color. So what, how opaque is that? That is pretty transparent actually. That is not a dark green. Uh, let's see. More mystery blue. What is it? Harbor blue. No. Oh, that makes a bright green. That has got to be a phthalo. Uh, it could be. It could be Prussian, though, too. Prussian makes nice, beautiful greens. All right. We're going to leave that tree alone. Stop putzing with it. All right, we need some more coffee bean. Ironic that I'm painting a, painting a color called coffee bean and I'm trying to keep my hand from shaking. That pole's got a bandana lean. Excellent. Oh, I'm putting my hand right in that. All right. Uh, along with that, we'll do a fence post. This guy's property clearly is more valuable than the other ones because he's got a fence around it. Maybe he's got horses or other things that require fences. I'm trying to ooh, I'm gonna lift some of that try I'm gonna try to lift some of that trunk out of there and get some white back. Yeah, we'll see. See how it does. It was wet over here where I would normally rest my hand. That looks pretty good, it seems like. We're gonna put a dark line a dark line across the ground here. Shadows. Oops, that is a wrong direction. Bird. Darken up the shadow around this tree. Grab some more nettle. Mix it in with my coffee bean and mystery blue and leather black, black leather, whatever it is. Give myself some dark grasses there in the foreground and around the tree.
Ew. Too thick. Transformer on that one. Well, typically a transformer only only hangs where it needs to drop off into somebody's house. So maybe I'll put a house in there. This is becoming way more involved than I had intended. And the shadow across the foreground is really long. Not quite sure what to do about that. Trees. Just add more trees. When in doubt, add trees. Do more trees somewhere when I finally figure out. All right, we're going to do some there. More nettle, please. All right, now I need some more coffee bean. Wait, which one's coffee bean? There we go. Well, all right, so as far as disparaging this these colors, uh, for being, you know, something I wouldn't give to a student if they really want to learn how to do watercolors, uh i i think i'm gonna take that back i mean you can get you can get the job done with these uh all right let's use our what's what what color what was that red that we used deep coral we're going to grab some deep coral. And here comes some red flowers. Red flowers over here around this tree. Some tiny one. Oh, that's not tiny. Uh, don't mess with it. Um, all right, so now by adding red there, I want to balance it a little bit. And I'm going to add a, oh, I hope I don't regret this. So far, so good. Where's my shadow colors? Mystery blue, coffee bean. Charge that into the shadow side of that little barn I just put in. Let that sit. Well, actually, let's dry it with a hairdryer. Not super happy with the splotchiness of this foreground tree here, but um, I don't want to. I don't have any. Yeah, I didn't have any uh, like a cadmium yellow. Normally, I would take a cadmium yellow and do some spotting. You know, like a like a opaque yellow. Where's my nettle at? Give me some more nettle. More mystery blue. Oh, I just fouled that out. Well, whatever. Not a big deal. Uh, 
All right, stop putzing, man. Stop putzing with the trees. All right, I'm going to putz with this one a little bit. Since it's closer, I want to get some more yellow on it. Come here, bright. No, not bright. Vibrant yellow. You're coming with me. All right, finish my barn out over there. That barn needs uh, a butterscotch roof. Is that butterscotch? Yeah, that's a that's a really weird looking butterscotch. Butterscotch roof. We're gonna add a little, little more field around that particular one. And we're gonna grab more mystery blue, get his green in it, mix it with the toffee bean. A little bit of a shadow. Couple of tiny windows. Tiny chimney or weather vane or whatever that is. Sticking up to define our. Oh, no, all right, leave that alone. Yeah, let's, you know what, let's clean that. I made our vibrant yellow not bright. Or not vibrant. Let's see how this white is. Hmm. White could be worse. Yeah. It's a little wimpy. Yeah, that white is pretty typical of cheap paint set white. It's it's more of a zinc than a than a titanium. Meaning that as it, yeah, gross. Meaning that as it sits on the paper while it's drying, it just sort of disappears and whatever colors underneath of it starts poking through. Alright, I know that's a tiny painting. I'm well over whatever time I didn't really allocate any time. This is a long video. Um again, you know, zip around, try to pick out the, the, the good points. I'm just enjoying myself with this set of paints and and uh experimenting. Hopefully it's fun to watch. I know I like watching other artists just paint. Try to pick up, you know, new tips and tricks or, you know, bad habits. <laughs> I'm just adding a few more little details in the foreground here. I want to add a tree around that barn, but I think I'm just going to leave it. I like I like that it's just sort of sitting out in that middle of that little field. Um, all right, I'm going to pause this, and I'm going to spray this with fixative, and that way I can varnish it. Now, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned it. This is Langton Prestige cold press paper that I'm using. I'll be right back. As soon as I figure out how to pause it, there we go. All right, I'm back. I sprayed it with a fixative and used the hair dryer on it to to blow it dry. Uh, I'm gonna go and move the paint. I, I'm not painting anymore, so I'm gonna get these out of my way uh, and put them somewhere in all of my vast flat spots that I don't have. My whole life, I, I just everything that I do, it seems like I always run out of flat spots. Too much clutter and poor decisions. So, all right, uh, got the fixative on there. We're gonna. Now, uh, I'm pretty confident in the colors that I chose 
there uh, to be pretty light fast. Uh, I only use, I don't know, four or five, six, maybe six colors. Um, I'm going to cover this with uh, a varnish with a ultraviolet protection. Um, and I'm also going to varnish it with matte varnish afterwards um, to protect it. And I'm going to, I'll sell this on eBay. There's no reason not to. Uh, most ACEOs that, that people have on eBay, they're not going to be exposed to a lot of ultraviolet light, you know, or light really. Most of mine just live in a binder um, forever. So again, when when using varnish over the top of watercolor, even even though I sprayed it with fixative, I like to get that first first coat on there and stop playing with it because you will reactivate the um, the watercolor underneath, and it, it will come through the fixative, and all of a sudden you're doing a glaze over the top. Um, with you know, mostly it would be that green tree that started spreading everywhere. The reason I'm using a gloss varnish, um, the UV protection in that, it's it's basically solids that that is particles in there that block the, the UV. So um, that will melt over your your painting. And if you mix that with a matte varnish, um, mats are also you know you know when you flatten the the sheen on a painting. That's done using particulates or or you know sediment in the in the varnish. So the gloss at least is a nice clear coat, um, even though it's got the UV protection in there. But it leaves I don't know if you can see it in the light or not. It leaves a, a shiny sheen, which is why I put the matte varnish over the top. The golden stuff, um, their polymer varnish, it's real thin. You saw how watery that was going on there, which is great because that soaks into the paper. Um, and it's only a thin coat. This stuff's a little thicker. Uh, it dries down pretty good, um, tightens up, but it has, it's absolutely dead flat. So I try not to use too much of it because I don't want to obscure the colors on the painting, but it it flattens the gloss from the, the UV protectant that I just used. Kind of ties the, it kind of ties the finish of the whole painting together and it makes you know these these varnishes they, they really pop the they, they pop the watercolor color you know how watercolors kind of lighten or fade out when they as they dry this brings them back to life and and makes them makes them vibrant again and it evens the shooting across the whole painting i can still see some gloss in that tree where I have a lot of the, the paint's fairly thick around that tree so it's still a little glossy so we're gonna put one more coat of the the matte varnish on there give this one a little thicker make sure we get a nice flat finish that you don't you don't get distracted by glare coming off the texture of the paper. The cold pressed paper has got a pretty good texture to it. And if it's, you know, you got any gloss there, it'll, it'll hit the highlights of the page. And even this matte finish will, will leave like a satin, a satin glaze over it. I've done, you know, similar ACOs with, uh, my little Prang Oval 8 set. I like to play with that just to, you know, it brings back a little nostalgia about, you know, when I was a kid trying to do watercolors and and uh, those old sets like that are pretty neat. The paints, yeah. To be honest, I like this paint better than Prang. Um, it feels like like the Prang blues, they're all, I'm sure they're phthalo base. Uh, this at least has some ultramarine in it. All right, so I'm going to cut this out real loose like. I'm not going to try to do the borders yet. 
because I still want to write on the back of it and then varnish over the, the graphite that I put on the back. And so I know, you know, basically stay in 3 sixteenths of an inch from the edge and I'm I'm still within in the back there. And we're gonna, we're gonna what are we gonna call this? That is Center Valley. That's a nice generic name. Man, I put my studio name on there. What am I doing? Stay up later, dude. Flick Rooster Study. Studio. Man, I am in Azel. Texas. Put my name on there. Today, let's see. It's well after midnight, so today is... Thousand twenty two, and this is watercolor on ten prestige hundred and forty pound cold press varnished. with color. No, no. After I put the gra graphite on there, I like to get the excess off it, and that way, when I when I do the do the varnish, did I say graphite? There, varnish. <laughs> when I write on there with a pencil, I like to knock the excess graphite off and give it a little wipe. That way, when I varnish it, it doesn't pick up too much of it and spread it around. Not that I mind that, but and on the back, I don't do the the UV protection. I just get this done and seal both sides of the paper. It it uh, stabilizes better. When the front dried, that poly really tightens up and shrinks, and it and it pulls the front of the paper in. And now we're doing it on the back. That'll pull and and it'll stabilize the whole um, painting front and back. And keep it from getting all warpy and wobbly. I'm gonna remember to clean this brush up. I, I've been developing a bad habit for some reason the past couple of weeks. Is I'll, I'll lay this brush off to the side and go, okay, I might use that again. And then I forget. And the other night I actually left it out all night, and it it was rock hard with the with the varnish in it. And I thought it was done. I've actually done it several times, um, but I was able to soak it off of there, and. Soak it, add a little ammonia to it, and that helps dissolve the acrylic. But yeah, brought it back to life. I've had this brush for a very, very long time, and it's just my go-to varnish brush now. You can't, there's no precision there at all. It's just a it's just a a nice nylon, soft nylon brush that good for varnishing things. So it's wet, that's why it's buckling. The, the, the back of the paper has swollen, which is why it buckled up that way. Now, as I dry it, you'll watch it shrink down, and it'll probably even go, it'll probably cup, like become concave as the stuff dries and tightens. Now it's at the point where it, the sheen is gone, and now it's actually curing the the polymer. We're going to tighten the buckle the other direction now. And it'll continue to cure the next few hours. But you see how 
all the wobble warping and buckling has gone out of the watercolor paper. It's because I've finished it the same way on both sides. Um, so it's normalized again. Any moisture that's still in there has traveled through the paper from front to back. And it's basically, it's like it's sealed by like saran wrap on both sides and the moisture inside. Now, if, if there was more moisture on the back, it's run through to the front and the paper that's still dampish inside of there is damp evenly from front to back, which is why it's not buckled anymore. And moving forward, this will not be affected by humidity. Like like a regular watercolor, uh, if you don't put a finish on it, it's just it's just basically naked paper there with some pigments stuck to it. Uh, it will be affected by humidity and moisture in the air. Doing the final cut. A little wobble right there I need to take care of. There we go. I like to seal my cut edges with a black marker. It just makes them look nicer. Gives them a little finished edge and the the black marker sort of bleeds into the, the front of the painting a little bit, giving it a little bit of a black border. Just kind of helps it pop. Well, there we go. Um, this is a an ACO baseball card size painting made with Bobble, wait, what is it? Bobble duck? No. Doodle bug? No. Doodle, doodle hog. Doodle hog watercolors. And I'll take a picture of this and, and put it at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Um, for hanging in there for an hour and 23 minutes with me while I go through a $12 set of watercolors. I am probably going to keep those paints and, and play with them. Pick out the ones that I would probably keep. Uh, just to have them. I don't know what I'm gonna do. If I, I'll sell it. I, I don't. It doesn't matter. I have I have all those paints in other you know brands and and I don't need them, but it was fun to play with this. So anyhow, take care, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.